This week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with Laurent Porte of Metrologique about software and automation trends within Industry 4.0. Plus, how well are manufacturers addressing the skills gap? We'll take a fresh look at that question when we come back. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for June 22nd, 2018. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. Indeed he is, and I'm Quality Digest publisher Mike Richmond. Our first story this week comes to us from Gartner, and Gartner, as many of you know, is a leading research and advisory firm. Uh, the company recently issued a pair of reports about digital applications in today's business culture. Taking together these two reports, first of which is titled, Digital Workers Offer a Reality Check on the Digital Workplace, and the second was, uh, Millennial Digital Workers Really Do Differ from Their Elders. Uh, those reports indicate that the way that employees personalize their tools says a lot about them and their organizations, and in tools, of course, we're talking about digital tools, obviously, okay. from, the, from, the, from the name of the reports there. How people, and again, there's, there's differences both in, uh, in the age of workers and in the type of workers, IT workers versus regular workers, oh, sure. okay. and millennial workers versus the others, how they differ, and, and there's some not surprising and some surprising results, too. Um, so I wanna run through a couple of the tidbits here uh, and data points from the research, because I think it's, it's fairly interesting. Um, the first one, 58% of European workers reported that their CIO, their chief information officer, was aware of their technical challenges at work. For US workers, that number is just 41%. Okay. That to me is a pretty significant difference between the amount of engagement of European CIOs and American CIOs. 58% of right. workers in Europe say that their CIO knows what they're, what, what they're up against. 41% in America, that's a right. pretty, pretty big difference. Um, another one, in terms of workplace applications, 58% of respondents stated that they often use real-time mobile messaging to communicate with their peers, and 52% use social media. And those are the two most frequently cited technologies in terms of digital t tools. People so, use social to media to communicate with their peers, that's yep, interesting. That's okay. interesting, <laughs> yeah. I, I, but it, it, gets, it comes to something that, that we're gonna talk about later in the report and, and some of the other information. Uh, another piece of information, 72% of digital workers somewhat agreed or strongly agreed that the digital tools provided by the organizations were sufficient to help them do their jobs. Right, pretty pretty, okay. pretty good, almost, almost three quarters. Okay. For those not in information technology, however, more than two thirds feel that the organization doesn't take proper advantage of their digital skills. Interesting. So regular workers, not IT workers, and the regular workers probably are probably skew a little bit older. Okay. Feels that there's maybe too much hand holding. There's not enough trust. There's not oh. enough. Uh, they, <laughs> Let hey, me show you how to use yeah, this. Mic. No, I can do it. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> well, but maybe you know. But the key thing is they think that <laughs> yeah, that the right. organization doesn't take advantage of the digital skills. So yeah. if you don't think the event, the organization is going to listen to you and take advantage of your skills, why even develop them? That's right, a pretty right, interesting yeah. point. Um, so if you got a problem, if you're a millennial, what do you do? You're going to Google it. I mean, many of us do, but millennials Get especially do. More than half of workers in this age range, Christopher knows all about this, <laughs> report trying to find answers to their digital technology questions online before calling their IT departments. And you Thank you very much. You probably would appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate Figure that. it out. <laughs> Figure it out, restart your computer. <laughs> Another place where age shows up is in the use of approved applications. This ties back to the whole social media thing. 26% of workers between the ages of 18 and 24 use unapproved applications <laughs> to collaborate with their coworkers compared to just 10% of those between the ages of 55 and 74. So if you're young, you're gonna say, the heck with what the company wants, I'm hey, gonna use Snapchat. Hey, there's this new thing, Instagram. Discord. Yeah, Discord, Discord. Discord, how bad can it be? Right, I mean. Actually, it's great. It's great, but no, that's really interesting. 26% versus 10%, almost three times as many of the younger people yeah. versus the older people are gonna use stuff that. Yeah. Is it something invented. that comes along, they wanna try they're it gonna out? They're gonna try it out. Yeah, yeah they, they use it in their private lives, so they use it in their, in their, in their work lives. So yeah. for more information, on these reports, it's really interesting stuff there. You can check out the Gartner website at gartner.com or you can attend their Digital Workplace Summit, 
which is coming up September 24th and 25th in London. So check that out. Really good stuff there from Gartner. <laughs> All right. Um, well, actually, uh, sticking with uh, kind of digital tools, um, given the number of supply chain disruptions we have seen in recent years, and <clears throat> very often these were from natural catastrophes, but there was also Fukushima, uh, which was both a natural catastrophe and not so much. Uh, anything that any tool that comes along that can help companies plan for a recover from a supply chain disruption is really welcome news, which is why the Automotive Industry Action Group, that's the AIAG, has announced a valuable new member benefit. It's a global supplier site map. This is a site map, it's an online tool, it's an uh, online interactive map that helps members manage risk in their supply chain by letting them search the location of suppliers, their suppliers, in the event of a natural disaster or maybe some sort of geopolitical unrest, whatever. <clears throat> the map allows you to easily search for suppliers by entering a city, a state, a zip code, or a country, and specifying the search radius, let's say up to 100 miles, let's say, and results appear as points on the map. So um, th think about if you've used Google Maps to search something. You know how Google Maps works. It, uh, you know, your map comes up and it's got a little red dot for the location that you're talking about. This is kind of the same idea. <clears throat> So you'll get a, uh, you know, a red dot for that specific location, or you might get a colored circle with numbers in it indicating the number of supplier sites within that area. So you might have a red circle with you know, 200 in it or something like that, meaning there's 200 matching suppliers within that area. So in addition, there's a little scrolling side panel that allows you to see more detail for each supplier, including uh, their address information, distance from the search location, uh, their website, AIG uh, membership status, whether or not they are certified suppliers uh, by IATF. Uh, most entries also feature uh, Google Maps Street View capabilities, which provides you with an interactive image of the facility, as well as the surrounding buildings and streets and other points of interest. Now, here is something that actually is actually pretty cool. I'm glad they did this. Uh, AIEG is offering this for free to its lower tier members uh, to help them assess the impact of you know, potential supply chain disruptions and accelerate recovery planning and so forth. So it's really useful for small companies that are often hit inordinately hard by natural disasters or other things like, you know, I don't know, tariffs. Um, Mm -hmm. So, what? and I played with it a little bit, just the little site that they had there, and basically you just enter in your inform the information that you want, this map comes up. Mm. So you could, if you knew, knew there was a, something going on in a particular area of the world where you had a supplier, mm -hmm. you could bring up the map, you could show where the suppliers were, the surrounding areas, you could look at the news and trying to, you know, you could make some decisions as to where maybe you might have a supply chain problem. Right. Or you might also want to look for other suppliers maybe see where they're at. That part of it is key. I mean, I would yeah. think that if you're already working with suppliers, you probably, you're know. probably yeah, already yeah. know where they're at. It's like, oh my yeah. gosh, that's in Fukushima, wherever it is, yeah. or, or in the local areas. But yeah. others, other options, yeah. okay, well, we're stuck, but what, what if we're stuck with in this area, Right. What's close, or what other supply chains can we kind of establish? Can you tap that help into? Us? Yeah. So it's pretty cool. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a real useful tool. So uh, thanks to AIAG for that. AIAG, yes, yeah, AIAG yeah. is a nonprofit organization. I think they're they're yeah. a .org, and uh, yeah. they're uh, they do some great work. Uh, yeah. We don't talk about them really enough. No, on the we show. don't they, actually. They really Given do. that we have a lot of members. So. No, yeah, <laughs> they do. They do. They do some really great work. Yeah. All right, we're going to turn now to the CMS corner uh, uh, of our show, and this is the segment where we take an up close look. Uh, up close and personal look at the people and technologies of our good friends at the Coordinate Metrology Society. And this is actually our final episode, Derek, believe it or not, the final episode of CMS Corner prior to the group's big annual show, oh, the there CMSC. We go. That's right, coming up, uh, uh, coming up just next, next month. month. That's right, it's only a month from now. Uh, and we're going to be doing a lot of coverage. We'll be doing some video coverage of the show as well, and I'll have some clips from people at CMSC. Uh, that's happening just in a month's time. Uh, the show kicks off in the, uh, the biggest little city in the world. Reno, Nevada on Ju uh, July 3rd, 23rd, uh, and it's gonna run for four action-packed days. Now, this is an opportunity for anyone working on portable 3D test and measurement solutions for close tolerance, large volume projects, to kind of see the latest and greatest hardware and software and peripherals that, that's out there uh, in the industry. A uh, really good kind of a 
information sharing opportunity. Uh, right. If you're in that space, if you've never been in the CMSC, uh, really good opportunity to learn a lot about what this is all about. And if you've avoided the US CMSC in the past, because it, in, in the past it's been portable metrology, portable large volume metrology, this yeah. year they're, uh, they're fixed, uh, doing stationary CMMs as well. Yeah. Traditional fixed, CMMs, stationary yeah. CMMs are, are coming to the party too. So uh, if you're in that space also, you want to check it out in, in Reno. All right, well our guest on the show today is from one of the longstanding solution providers that really makes the CMSC such a, a valuable and, and unique event. He's uh, Laurent Port. Uh, he's the managing director for leading 3D inspection software company, Metrologique. So Laurent, thanks for joining us here in Quality Digest Live. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's our pleasure to have you. And uh, I think it's the first time we've had you on the show. So really, uh, Absolutely. Thank, you, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, Laurent, if I, can, if I can just jump in. Um, uh, People usually focus on hardware, but in this space, it's it's refinement. Very often now, it's it's becoming more the refinements in software that are really making improvements to quality uh, at a high level. So, what does software like your company's uh, Metrologique um, do once a company acquires data points from, let's say, an articulated arm? Well, that's that's a great question. Thank you for asking it, uh, and that's where Metrologic come uh, come in play. Um, I would say that even before the point cloud acquisition, uh, it's important to understand that Metrologic always seeks to fully integrate uh, with the measurement devices that we connect to. Uh, for example, uh, to be able to modify the optical profile of that device or to programmatically trigger the measurement device. Um, it's very important for us um, because we seek to provide an all-encompassing interface uh, to the to the user. Um, also, again, before we talk about what happens after the point cloud, um, Metrologic has the ability to import what we call the GDNTs, uh, the manufacturing information from a part um, into Metrolog. And with that, we have the ability to grab those features uh, from an existing database because it is existing in the CAD model and something that we can use and that's much better than basically creating them one by one uh, using the manufacturing drawing and putting that into Metrolog. So what happens when uh, the point cloud is generated from let's say a portable device? The first thing that's important like for any uh, devices, whether it's a CMM, a tracker or uh, a portable device is the alignment. So we have in Metrolog, powerful alignment strategies that will allow us to uh, meet the challenges of different industries from the simplest uh, one to the most complex, uh, complex uh, for example, best fit uh, to some very complex 23 point alignment for airfoil and things like that. Uh, repeatable alignments are very important as you uh, understand. Uh, once the alignment is done, we have to retrieve all our features uh, one by one using various methods um, in the software. Uh, and then the analysis take place. The goal is to uh, compare the actual features with the nominal features. Uh, then the reporting takes place. So these are basically the, the various steps that happen. Uh, for Metrologic, it's really important to provide to the uh, user the best experience possible. So we have developed a, uh, a programming engine which allows the user to repeat indefinitely um, the uh, the actions that he puts in the software um, and to, to be able basically to do that over and over uh, in a very uh, easy way, in a powerful way, um, and we want to provide a very ergonomic software that will allow to do that. So as as people could understand from, from listening to you, you have a, you have a very deep uh, understanding of this industry and, and, and what it takes to, to acquire uh, data and to utilize it. Um, looking at it from a higher level, what do you see as the state of the metrology industry today? Uh, what are some of the issues that are confronting it? And, and one I, I know you're going to talk about is, is education and training of the next generation. So how does like an organization like the CMSC, the Coordinate Metrology Society and their conference, help kind of lead people into the industry and give them the, the knowledge they need to succeed in the industry? I think that um, the state of the metrology industry, we can see a big change happening right now. And it's actually one of the reasons why I joined Metrologic, uh, coming from a robotic background. Uh, we see uh, the industry uh, shifting toward optical non-contact uh, inspection uh, and the shift towards automated inspection. People want to inspect in line, near line, they don't want to have to bring the part in a CMM lab where you're going to have to wait for two hours, maybe one day before something gets in inspected. 
so optical uh, metrology is not for everyone. Uh, it's not very accurate uh, yet. Maybe sheet metal, welded assemblies, uh, perhaps made for defect detection. But for sure, CMMs do remain the most accurate piece of technology um, out there. Um, so there are some challenges to that shift that we're seeing. Are people ready for it? Are people trained? Uh, are standards in place? And if they are, what are the standards? So I think that where the CMSC can really bring uh, some answers, uh, first of all, the, the conference by itself um, um, provides a platform to educate uh, people. It provides uh, um, information that are needed to make decisions on future purchases and investments for companies. Uh, also provides hands-on opportunities uh, for the attendees to play with various equipment and learn from industry experts uh, in a non-threatening way, I would say, unlike sometimes a more of a trade show where um, you want to sell your products. We are there because we want our name to be recognized, but we are also there because we want to give back to the community. We want to give uh, the attendees a chance to discover various uh, equipments and technologies and solutions. So I think that um, in terms of training, the CMSC does a great job um, at offering the, uh, for example, the tracker certification which has been happening for many years. It's a very successful program, and I think it really sets a better standard for the industry. Um, it does provide credentials uh, for the certified users, uh, so their skills be recognized. Um, and so companies out there uh, can see that uh, people they are um, hiring or interviewing for a job have the knowledge that is essential uh, to perform that job. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, uh, the CMS is launching a pilot program for CMM users uh, as well as for 3D scanner users. So um, sending a call out there to all the CMM users and optical measurement devices users, come to the CMSC, uh, take a look at the certification program. Well, one thing we talk about on the show a lot, and I know Dirk, we, you and I have talk, talked about it a lot at Envinitum, is, is Industry 4.0, this fourth industrial revolution that's uh, we're undergoing right now. You mentioned robotics, certainly uh, Internet of Things, big data, all the all these elements that are coming together really and creating so much information uh, for manufacturers uh, in their in their workspace. So, what are some of those trends that you see that are prevalent, and how do you think they're going to affect manufacturing uh, of the future as we go forward? Okay, um, so Industry 4.0, um, you know, that's the name we give uh, for the trend of automation and data exchange that we see in the manufacturing technology. Uh, I think that by nature, metrology is central uh, to the manufacturing industry uh, and to the smart factory because it links the CAD model and the manufactured part. Uh, so the game changer that I see that is happening now and that, that I was talking about is um, the introduction of robots in the inspection world. Uh, the global robotic market is expected to grow at an annual growth rate of about 24% for the next four years. And um, I think that we will see a very large increase or a large portion of that growth into the inspection industry because today we do have robots uh, on inspection lines uh, for automotive industry, but we don't see so many of them for uh, the suppliers uh, and the suppliers of those suppliers, but we see more and more people wanting to go to near line and in line inspection cells so they can get instant feedback on uh, manufacturing. But the increase of robotic inspection doesn't come without uh, a change uh, or improvement in uh, or for the optical 3D measurement devices that are mounted on these robots. Uh, we see that this, uh, this market is also growing really fast. Um, many companies such as Zeiss, Creaform, um, Leica, uh, Nikon have released handheld devices uh, that then realized they could mount them on robots and basically create a robotic inspection cell. Uh, as these devices become more readily available, become cheaper and become more accurate, they will replace uh, the traditional uh, means of inspection such as CMMs. So that gives us a factory that has eyes to see what is happening and it's really important to be able to have that instant feedback. But what do we do with that data? Data can be good, data can also be overwhelming. So at Metrologic we 
truly believe that we are well placed to utilize uh, that data to send it back to an upstream uh, manufacturing process and to be able to impact that process in order to contain variability. So I think that's a big game changer if companies out there can stop producing um, batches of parts that are bad only to discover that two or three hours or two or three days later then they can really improve their process and make more money and and, and uh, just in, in a couple of minutes that we have left just briefly um so what's how what, what's metrology going to show uh, attendees at the show what are you guys going to surprise people with this year we are going to continue to show our universal um, metrology solutions for CMM strikers, portable arms, optical scanners, and robotic inspection. We are going to show our powerful offline simulation engine because um, the more we go, the more we see that the people, companies, the industry want to be able to automatically create uh, programs and not have to spend hours and days uh, doing that. Uh, and we're going to continue to show our robotic uh, inspection uh, devices. Uh, Metrologic is also uh, sponsoring this year the, uh, the Wednesday banquet um, that as a way to thank the community of uh, the CMSC uh, for all that they give to us throughout the year. So we are really excited to be part of it this year again. Excellent. Well, we appreciate that. We'll be at that banquet. We will be at we'll, the banquet. We will be eating on your dime, so we <laughs> appreciate right. that, Laurent. And, and we, you pre much. we appreciate you joining us today for, for CMS Corner. We'll, we'll see you in Reno uh, next month. Sounds good, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. See, see you, Laurent. See you, Laurent. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a fun, fun thing. The, the banquet's always fun on Wednesday. <laughs> the whole thing's fun. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a really it's a good conference. Like we, yeah. we mentioned last week, shows like this, which are very, which are tend to be small, um, whether they're user conferences or just small shows like this, really are useful because there's just a lot more interaction yep. between everybody. You have more time to spend with vendors and solution providers and stuff like that. So it's it, it's really worth going to. So. Yeah, and they got a rec record <coughs> amount of white papers presented this year. Yeah, and and the white papers are always really great. Really like well. 30 white papers, so a lot of really good information. Yep. Well, you know, we debuted a new QD author we, this we, week. We always like yes. doing that. Yeah, yeah it's always, yeah. always yeah. fun when we find a yeah. new one. Uh, this is Megan Ray Nichols. Megan specializes uh, in, in tech tech and science and STEM related mm -hmm. topics primarily. And her story this week, how are manufacturing addressing the skills gap mm -hmm. focused on a subject that we actually have been given quite a bit of coverage to recently, getting trained workers into the manufacturing workforce. And by most reports, says Nichols, many manufacturers lack enough well-trained employees with the strengths in the areas that those companies need. And this is what has created a, a worker source uh, shortage based on this skills gap. There are workers out there, but they, they meant, might not necessarily have the, the technical expertise in the areas that these companies need. Yep. So, what do you do? Well, companies are responding to the skills gap in a lot of ways. And Nichols uh, talks about five of them in her article, and we'll just kind of breeze through them real, real quickly here. The first, obviously, we've talked about this a lot, is apprenticeships. Apprenticeships, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, apprenticeships abounded. Everybody did apprenticeships. If you yeah. were going to get into a new field, you went through an apprenticeship. They slowly died out. In the last decade, they've been coming back. Mm -hmm. um, in part because of this, is like, okay, if we're not going to get workers out there, we're going to have to train them ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's where apprenticeships come in. And not just the United States, the UK as well. We've had uh, Keith Bevan from the National um, Physical Laboratory. Uh, National Physical yeah. Laboratory, N thank you. NPL yeah, in, in, the uh, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, hey, UK is the same thing, just this huge spurt yeah. in. Um, in the growth of apprenticeships. Uh, Nichols uh, reports that up to 70% of work knowledge comes from on-the-job learning. So things like, you know, like things like apprenticeships. Now, for companies that may not be able to run their own programs, another option is to send people to school. In other words, if you can't run your own apprenticeship programs, then what some companies are doing are paying to go to a tech school or a voc tech school or a, you know, a JC that offers, sure. offers some sort of a, a technical training, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's another route around maybe apprenticeships. Uh, another method for closing the skills gap is educating current employees. Now this one's interesting because the idea here is that 
you might have employees, let's say lower paid employees that are interested in maybe being, you know, a CNC operator or a welder or, you right. know, getting out of the stock room and doing something that is more skilled and pays more. So what you do is you train those people up and then you backfill those lower skilled positions yeah. which are easier to fill mm -hmm. from the workforce. Oh, and, the, and those positions are the ones that are more likely going away to begin with. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah. you know, you have these people that have been with you for a couple of years maybe and you're like, well, we don't want to get rid of them. We trust them, they're good employees, right. but their job maybe is going away. Yeah. Train them to do something Train different. Train them into something bring, different. Bring so them up the food chain. Particularly if they're interested. Yep. Uh, another thing manufacturers are doing is promoting manufacturing as a desirable yep. career. We've talked about this over and over again. Uh, manufacturing is changing, but there's still a perception out there, although it's changing, that manufacturing is just a you know brute force, get your fingernails dirty scrungy job, you know, who mm -hmm. wants that, right? And really it's not that anymore, and, or in m many, many cases it isn't that anymore. I mean, there's a lot of technology yeah. in manufacturing, a lot of cool stuff to do in manufacturing that don't involve any more, you know, spinning nuts onto, uh, onto wheels. Well, and this is this is also why I think it's so interesting that we had uh, a Megan, a woman writing this piece for us. Oh, yeah. Because I mean, there's so many women getting into STEM and being trained in STEM careers right. that this idea that is a brute force job is, is, is passe is going away. And not that women can't do brute force jobs too, but what I'm saying is there, there is a lot of opportunity for everybody to do this work. Well, and it's interesting you, you mentioned women because she talks about that. She talks about, you know, maybe uh, another solution is to cast a wider net. And yep. she points out that women are half of the population, but they only hold 29% of manufacturing yep. jobs. So there is a huge pool out there, maybe for women who are seeking to uh, re-enter the, uh, uh, re the workforce, or maybe you know, coming out of school and want yep. to do something and you know, being, you know, sorry to be sexist here, but you know, a secretary just does not apply and then they want something you know, that's gonna you know, be more, well, yeah. maybe more creative or involve you know, their technical interests and that exactly, sort of stuff. Exactly, exactly, yep, yep. Yeah. And one, one way she says to help that is to, um, to generate role models within your company uh -huh. that can go out to talk to people. And as soon as she mentioned that, I thought of like Rena uh, uh, Molinari from Hexagon. Oh, Rena, Rena Malari, yeah, yeah, Malari, yeah, 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 and yeah, Michelle yeah. Edwards of Farrell. These Farrell. are both yep. women who have like super interesting jobs out in the field working yeah. with technical stuff. Yeah. And when they talk about it, there's such a passion yeah. there. Yeah. So women like that can really be role models yeah. to get uh, you know younger women interested in, uh, in manufacturing jobs. And finally, ironically, Nichols points out that the very technology that has, in a way, led to the skills gap is also a solution. So using technology like virtual reality and augmented reality to help train people. Yeah. Uh, you know, VR and AR speed mm -hmm. the training process because they allow you to interact in a real or simulated environment to speed up training. Yeah. Uh, much faster than book learning or even in some cases better than working with a mentor. So there's a lot of things out there that companies can do to, to help generate their workforce of the future. So mm -hmm. basically, if you break these down into two, there's either retrain, you know, apprenticeships or retraining your own workers, or starting lower down, get, you know, get kids and, uh, you know, young people interested in manufacturing so that as they go through the education process, they might graduate high school and rather than look at college, uh, they might look at a Voc Tech school yeah. or, a, or a JC with a with a, a you know a technical Community emphasis. Community college, and, and, all yeah. those things. Yep, yeah. yep. And, and those are you know if if you can get kids interested early on, then that's going to be your manufacturing workforce. And again, in the those are those are good jobs. A lot of those are really, and yeah, really a lot of these are great jobs. They're well-paying jobs. Good, well -paying and interesting jobs. jobs. And so. interesting jobs too. Yep. Yeah, no no doubt about it. So all right, good, good stuff there. So Mike, do you want to talk about uh, tariffs or do you want to talk about mobile workforce? Oh my gosh. Let's talk about the tariff on mobile, mobile workers now. Um, <laughs> tariff on mobile workers, yeah. Well, uh, um, tariffs. Tariffs, all right, okay. So, Mr. History here. Um, so, you know, the tariffs are in the news a lot right now, and we're, we're ramping up uh, <laughs> to what looks like a trade war. No one wants to get Yeah, yeah. So, have there been trade wars maybe of this scope in the past? Do tariffs work from, from your oh understanding boy. of history? I mean, kind of fill us in uh, for those of us who don't know history as much as you. Uh. Well, uh, I think the general 
accepted wisdom is that trade wars don't work real well. Uh, despite our president's statement that, that trade wars are great and easy to win, they're, they're, they're not. They're usually generally, a, generally a tariff is a tax on consumers, all consumers, <clears throat> everyone involved. It's a tax on Chinese consumers, American consumers, European consumers, Canadian, Canadian consumers, consumers, consumers right, right, Mexican exactly. consumers, everybody. So that's never a good thing. Yeah. Um, it, it probably hurts the consumers more than it hurts the companies because the companies are just going to raise their, their prices to, to, to make up for that and the, the consumers are the ones that are going to pay for it, whether it's food or, or any goods. I mean, Obama had a tax, I think, on tires. I had a tariff on tires, Chinese tires, because they were flooding the market with really okay. cheap tires. Uh, and I think that he, they tried a tariff on that, which I think, I don't think it worked. I think that he, he, he trumpeted it as, you know, hey, we, we saved American jobs and I don't know that it really helped much of any. Um, Bush had Bush one or Bush two, I think, had a steel tax or a steel tariff. Um, but there, I mean, there's been tariffs throughout American history, sure, I mean, yeah, 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 throughout yeah, world yeah. history. But yeah. I mean, American history. Hamilton was a big was, was in favor of tariffs right from the get go of the of the of the, of the, of the republic. This idea that you know you need to protect American um, industry, and at that point in the 18th century, in the early 19th century. American in industry was in its infancy. It needed to be protected, you know, because European manufactured goods were so much better. But, you know, by the middle of the 19th century, America really had caught up with that. And there already was this understanding that, uh, that free trade, fair trade was better. Now, after World War II, it was really codified by, by, by GATT, by the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and the World Trade Organization, that really has been very sturdy for 70 years. The, the little things like, you know, like say Obama with, with a tire tariff or Bush with a steel tariff, but I mean, other than that, there's been a generally accepted wisdom that free trade, fair trade is better for everybody, because again, it, it's less for the, the, the consumer to have to pay. Right. Um, you know, Trump and the Trump administration now don't necessarily believe that. They feel like, you know, this is a zero-sum game, that they're going to win, somebody else is going to lose. Well, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I mean, I don't, I don't know that economists, and I think most economists will tell you that that's not true, that tariffs are a bad thing overall. Some now will say, well, within certain frameworks, like there's been some re, re, reappraisal of this idea that the U.S. manufacturing industry is just gonna, gonna go away, okay. necessarily. Well, no, maybe some level of protectionism can support some level of jobs, but again, the consumers broadly are gonna pay more. Yes, you're gonna support some jobs and help some workers in some industries, but consumers overall are probably gonna pay more, so net-net, is it a good thing or not? I don't know. And Sorry, that was a very long way no, to no, answer. No, that, no, that, that, that's fine. Um, is there, and I haven't heard anybody really discuss this much, is, is I, 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 I look at trade disparities, let's say U.S. and China, kind of the same way I look at the deficit. Yeah, who cares? Who, exactly. I mean, so, so we've, we've got, oh, we've got to bring down the deficit. It'll never happen. I mean, it's only the billions, well, right? So it's like, who, it's like funny money yeah, to me. It, 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 you know, this idea that, okay, we have a trade deficit with China. Who cares? We got the, we got the stuff. I mean, we right. bought stuff, okay, that China was manufacturing. We bought it at Walmart or whatever. So what? So what's the, the argument? The American consumer, I don't know. I don't <laughs> okay. know that they're, I don't, I think the- Because it comes up every administration. Well, the the I mean. argument is that you're going to support American workers. By, okay, okay, by, okay. by you know you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna make it so that the the prices of the stuff coming in are gonna be hit with this the, the stuff coming in is gonna be hit with this tariff. The oh, price so they'll buy, they'll buy so local, they're gonna buy American stuff. Yeah, but unless it's like really a crazy tariff, I, mean, I don't think it happens. Yeah, but even if it does, what's gonna happen is I mean the prices are just gonna go up overall, right? right. I mean uh, for for all these goods. So I mean like Walmart's not gonna stop buying Chinese goods, even if the tariffs hit it. It's still gonna be cheaper generally than American goods. I mean if they raise the tariff so high that the American goods are comparable in terms of the sourcing price, the wholesale price of that. I guess Americans would buy more products, but again, then the Chinese are just going to retaliate, and the prices going over are going to have to be higher too. The stuff like soybeans or right, right, whiskey right. or whatever it is that they're they're <laughs> right, right. putting their butter. tariffs yeah. on. Yeah, okay. um, you know, so it's a compl it's a very complicated, uh, involved system. It's an organism, really, and it's the, you can't just change one little element of it and think it's not going to change the whole thing. It's going to change everything. I mean, tariffs overall, I think, do function as a tax on consumers everywhere. Well, I, I'd be interested in hearing what, what our viewers uh, what our yeah. viewers think. So, I mean, I mean, for your company, uh, just just drop us an email or text yeah. us or whatever. I mean, for your company, do you feel that that tariffs 
are going to to help or not help or have no effect at all. Well, I mean, just, I, I, I'd be interested for those that think that they are going to help. Why? What does that mean when you say oh, yeah. help? I yeah. mean, maybe you're, you're working with carrier or whatever, and these yeah. jobs are going to stay here, or whatever company you're, you're working with. If you're competing with Chinese uh, manufacturers in the market, what do you think that's going to do for you? Is that going to give you more jobs? Is it going to save the jobs that you guys have? Are you going to make more money as as a as a worker at those companies? Yeah. But on the flip side of that, how do you feel about the fact you might pay more? For, for the stuff when you go to shop at Walmart or wherever. I mean, yeah, let us know. complicated issue, but let us know. Yeah. Well, that's our show. Thank you all for joining us. Our first summer show of, yeah. of, the, of the year. It's 101 degrees today here. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be a nice, cool 104 over the weekend. Uh, thanks to uh, Laurent, Laurent Port of uh, Metro Logique for joining us uh, earlier today via Skype. Thanks to you all for joining us. Um, we're gonna see you next week for another episode of Quality Digest Live, and we'll have uh, Another big week of Quality Digest newsletters and articles coming up for you starting on Monday. So Good stuff. Come back and join us. All right, see you then. Have a good weekend. Bye.